Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Admiral James Stavridis is an operating executive of the Carlisle Group. Following five years as the 12th Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, a retired four-star officer in the United States Navy, he led the NATO Alliance in global operations from 2009 to 2013 as Supreme Allied Commander with responsibility for Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, Syria, counter piracy, and cybersecurity. He also served as commander of U.S. Southern Command with responsibility for all military operations in Latin America from 2006 to 2009. He has earned more than 50 medals, including 28 from foreign nations in his 37-year military career. Earlier in his military career, he commanded the top ship in the Atlantic Fleet, winning the Battenberg Cup, as well as a squadron of destroyers and a carrier strike group, all in combat. In 2016, he was vetted for vice president by Hillary Clinton and subsequently invited to Trump Tower to discuss a cabinet position in the Trump administration. Admiral Stavridis earned a PhD in international relations and has published nine books and hundreds of articles in leading journals around the world. His 2012 TED Talk on global security has over one million views. Admiral Stavridis is a monthly columnist for Time Magazine and chief international security analyst for NBC News and has tens of thousands of connections on social networks. Please join me in welcoming Admiral Stavridis. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Well, what a pleasure to be uh, back in Annapolis, a uh, proud member of the class of 76. I, uh, um, here's the deal. I want to uh, begin by thanking you for a terrific introduction. And normally, when people hear that introduction, you know, Supreme Allied Commander and so on, and then they actually see me, they generally have two reactions. One is, boy, I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> and, and the other one, you know, the other one goes right to the heart of what you're all thinking about, which is service selection. The other reaction people have is, you know, Stavridis, if you're really that cool, why were you not a Navy pilot? Why were you not a naval aviator? Because I was a surface line officer. And, you know, okay, I'm going to be really honest with the brigade. I wanted to be a naval aviator, like the superintendent, Admiral Buck, you know, it would be very cool to be a naval aviator. But I had a very traumatic experience when I was a young boy at an airport uh, that made aviation difficult. <laughs> so I couldn't be a naval aviator. So I thought, okay, you know, I've got pretty good grades. Maybe I could be a nuclear submariner. Like we have a, it's okay, stay calm out there. I could be a nuclear submariner like our former chief of naval operations who's here, uh, John Greenert, Admiral John Greenert. And, you know, for a while I thought, okay, I'm going to try and be a nuclear submariner. So I actually signed up for a summer cruise. They put me on a submarine. I was in the Mediterranean. And they actually uh, gave me the con of the submarine as we were pulling into uh, Venice, and that didn't go well. <laughs> so that, you know, kind of x me out of the nuclear program. And then I thought, you know, maybe I can become a SEAL, and that was really not an option because I'm not a great swimmer. And then, so I'm working my way through the choices, and then I thought, well, maybe I can be a Marine. Uh, yeah, exactly. Very proud, Semper Fi. And, you know, my dad was in the Marine Corps, and I thought, okay, you know, I can be a Marine. But um, I had a lot of trouble, you know, with the, the equipment uh, of being a Marine. <laughs> a lot of Marines have trouble with the equipment of being Marines. So bottom line. I became a destroyer officer, and I sailed ships. So here's the plan. 
We're going to do this quick. I'm here to talk about leadership, but I want to frame it by talking about the challenges in the world today. Essentially, why we need leaders and why we need leadership. So we're going to kind of like this sailor, we're going to look at the horizon, talk a little bit about what's out there in the world that all of you will face in defending this country. And then we'll talk about the tools of leadership that I hope you will employ as you take on that sacred duty. So let's begin with a challenge that you can barely remember. 9-11. This, of course, was a terrible day. You recognize this photograph. What you don't recognize is that little red circle. That was my office. I watched the airplane hit the Pentagon. I was a newly selected one-star admiral. And when I stumbled out onto that grassy field, trying to figure out how to let my wife, Laura, who's here tonight, know that I was still alive. I interacted with those first responders, the real heroes of the day. And what struck me was the irony of this moment, because here I was in the safest place in the world, right? By definition, I'm in the Pentagon. I'm surrounded by concrete walls, guarded by the strongest military on Earth in the capital of the richest country on the planet. Was I safe? No. And that day, almost 20 years ago, has led to a continuing stream of violent extremism that has emanated not only from the Middle East, from radicalized elements in Islam, but also recognizes an ongoing plan to try and create a caliphate. Look at Spain. I don't think Spain is going to be called Andalus anytime soon. But when these groups are this venal, this clever, and they have a plan, we need to worry about them. And of course, violent extremism is not only emanating from Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya, it can be closer to home. Meet Anders Breivik, Norwegian. Several years ago, <clears throat> several years ago, he bombed the government house in Oslo. You see the result of that. He killed seven. Later that day, he took high-powered weapons, went to a small island off the coast, and killed 70 young Norwegians at what we would think of here in the United States as boy state or girl state. Upper left, that's Anders Breivik in court. He was captured. He is here apologizing. He's apologizing to the forces of right-wing nationalism in Europe for not having killed more people on that day. So this violent extremism comes not only from the Middle East, it can manifest in Europe. It can be here in the United States. This is Dylan Roof, a white supremacist who killed innocent worshipers at an iconic African-American church in Charleston, South Carolina. Upper right, Representative Pinckney, a leading voice in the state legislature of South Carolina. And more recently, we see anti Semitic attacks directed against Jews in America. All of this violent extremism ought to concern us, and it is part of the leadership challenges that we will face. What else? We had to worry about this region of the world. This is Syria, this is Bashar al-Assad, the war dictator criminal of Syria. He's killed 600,000 of his own people. He has pushed millions out of their homes, and it leads to this, to waves of refugees that roil the politics of Europe. So this violent extremism will continue to plague us and be part of the challenges that all of you will face as you wear the cloth of the country. 
you may also face challenges here. Iran, you recognize the flag of Iran. You probably don't recognize the Sahil-2 missile alongside it. Iran is continuing to push and push and push in the Middle East. And let me show you a map. Look at that green area. You probably think, OK, Admiral Stavridis is showing us the areas where the Iranians are pushing in the Middle East. No. That map is from 2,500 years ago. It's the map of the Persian Empire at its greatest extent. Those flags, upper left, Xerxes the Magnificent, Darius the Great. The Iranians don't see themselves as an annoying mid-level power in the Middle East. They see themselves as inheritors of an imperial tradition. And in that region, it's not only upper right, Shia Iran, lower left, it's Sunni Saudi Arabia. Parked in the middle, Israel, our closest ally, partner, and friend in this region. So this, alongside violent extremism, will be part of the leadership challenges we will face in this 21st century. Who's this? Vladimir Putin. He is no friend to the United States. He has invaded and annexed part of Ukraine. And here's our problem in dealing with Putin. We continue to look for the strategic terrain somewhere on this map, except it's not here. The strategic terrain is right there, the mind of Vladimir Putin. And let me show you the results. I could show you this map. It looks pretty benign, right? Let me show you what Ukraine looks like, photographs taken two weeks ago. It's a war. 16,000 people have died there. And this will continue until we find a leadership set of approaches to deal with Vladimir Putin. In addition to violent extremism in nations that operate outside the norms of international law, we had to worry about this. Transnational threats, what crop is this? Poppies, yeah, opium. This is Afghanistan. And of course, it's not just poppy. It's cocaine. This is actually a very hopeful picture. This is a cocaine bust at sea. This is a high-tech US Navy vessel capturing a drug runner. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. The high-tech US Navy vessel is the one on top. The one on the bottom that looks like Batman submarine, that was built in the jungle of Colombia by the drug cartels. When I was Southern Command and we caught this thing, and truth in advertising, there's a Navy destroyer just outside the picture. When we caught this thing, it had 10 tons of cocaine in it. Street value, Washington, DC, 20 minutes away, $150 million. This is big business, and it undermines fragile democracies. Alongside violent extremism and national threat, we had to park this transnational set of concerns as well. How about this? We just saw the first case of coronavirus in the United States today in Washington State. Pandemics will come at us. Dealing with them will require leadership. At the top is Ebola, upper right, patient zero in the United States. Bottom is Zika, bird flu, coronavirus. Pandemics are coming. And if you don't think so, Google Spanish influenza, Spanish flu. 100 years ago, Spanish influenza infected, listen to these numbers, 40% of the world's population with a mortality rate of 20%. That happens every 100 to 200 years in human history, despite all of the advances in medicine. So in addition to all of the man-made challenges I've mentioned, we had to worry about pandemics, 
and we ought to worry about the environment. And I'm not here to debate climate with you, but I will give you a fact from someone who has sailed the waters of the Arctic and the Antarctic. The ice is melting, and it will continue to melt. And we have to deal with rising sea levels. We have to deal with the environmental outputs. And doing so will require leadership. Lastly, until we turn to the tools of leadership, let's recognize that we have a peer competitor rising. These are Chinese ballistic missile submarines. If you want to read one book, to understand this competition that's unfolding in this 21st century, check out Destined for War by Graham Allison. Note there is not a question mark at the end of that. My own view is we can avoid a war with China, but it will require deft diplomacy and real leadership. Part of this, of course, will be North Korea. Kim Jong-un, he's well-named, he's unpredictable, he's kind of unstable, he's morbidly obese, he's addicted to opioids, and he has a really bad haircut, which I think is kind of holding him back, except he's got 50 to 70 nuclear weapons. We have to exercise the tools of leadership to solve this. And we, Naval Academy graduates, ought to be proud of the current US ambassador to South Korea, who is dealing with this on a daily basis, a P3 naval aviator, Admiral Harry Harris who is remarkable and understands leadership and is an example of how leadership can be employed to solve some of these challenges. So I'll wrap up this tale of woe before we turn to what can we do about it by saying, let me answer the question I got a lot as Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. People would say, well, you know, that's a big job. What what worries you the most? What really keeps you awake at night? Is it Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, Syria, piracy? No. What worried me the most was cyber. Cyber. These are the flags of Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Georgia. What they have in common is that all of them have been attacked significantly by Russia, over the last five years in the cyber world. This will continue. Here at the Naval Academy, we have a marvelous program creating real cyber warriors. I applaud that because we're gonna need them to defend many aspects of our life and society, but especially our grid. And let me give you an example of how I think about the grid. And I'm going to do it, if you'll indulge me, with the thought that I can snap my fingers and bring back to life any scientist in history, right? So I'm going to bring back Alexander Graham Bell. What did he invent? Telephone, thank you. So I would say to Dr. Bell, hey, here's a telephone. This is what you invented, except this one has no wires can communicate point to point anywhere in the world, can access all the world's knowledge, can play any symphony ever recorded, can take photographs, can measure distance. Dr. Bell would look at this like, you know, my basset hound looks at a wristwatch. It just wouldn't make any sense. Why? Because we've moved on so far. So let me snap my fingers again. This time, I'm going to bring back Thomas Alva Edison. What did he invent? Light bulbs. He also built the first grid in New York City. It was a city block. And if I laid out the plans of the US electric grid for Thomas Alva Edison, he would say, huh, 
Okay, source, wires, transformer, substation, wires, transformer, load. You bet I can work on that for you. The point is we have made incredible, unbelievable strides here. The grid, not so much. You want to read one book that'll really keep you awake at night, read The Grid by Gretchen Bakke. Those of you who are studying cyber and preparing to defend this nation in that realm will have your hands full. This is part of the leadership challenges we will face. All of this occurs in a geopolitical backdrop. Our closest pool of partners and friends in the world pulled apart by centrifugal forces. And what's our problem here in the United States? Gridlock. And here I am talking to you, if you are center left and you watch MSNBC and Morning Joe and Rachel Maddow, or you are center right and you are watching Fox News, the folks on the white couch in the morning and listening to Sean Hannity at night, this is the most critical problem facing our nation today, is our gridlock, our inability to have civil conversation across divided opinions. All of this requires leadership to solve. So right about now, you ought to be saying, Woo, okay, Admiral, I'm worried. <laughs> it's a lot of challenges. What are the tools? What's my role? How can I grow into the kind of leader who can address some of these significant challenges for our nation? Because that's why I walked in the door at Annapolis. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about three models of leadership. I'm going to take you back to the 19th century. We're going to look at a historical model. Look at this map. Almost every country is pink except for a few that are in white. What all of the pink countries have in common is that they were invaded by a colonial power. This is the 19th century world. It is a leadership model that is hierarchical, male-dominated, extremely streamlined, and if I were going to give you one face to put on 19th century leadership, be this character. Who's this? Very good. Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor, 19th century leader. He was called the Iron Chancellor for a quote. And the quote was, the great issues of our time will not be decided by chattering parliaments but by men of blood and iron, the Iron Chancellor. This is 19th century leadership. Things change in the 20th century. The world turns upside down figuratively. All of those colonial countries become nations. Now we go from 35 nations to 200 nations. Who's the face of 20th century leadership? I'd make a case for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Benign, smiling, charming. Leadership evolves. But let me tell you something about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. When you would go to dinner, if you were lucky enough to be invited to the White House, you would go to dinner with him, and he would get out a map of the United States, kind of like a parlor game. He'd give you a pencil, and it'd say, Tom, draw a line across the United States anywhere you want, from San Diego to Bangor, Maine, from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., from Seattle, Washington to Miami. Just draw a line. So you would draw a line in pencil. President Roosevelt would then walk down that line with you. And he wouldn't tell you, you know, the state or the state capital or the governor, he would tell you the name of the county on that line. 
There are 3,104 counties in the United States. He'd tell you the name of the county, the county commissioner, and the head of the Democratic Party machine in that county. That's 20th century leadership. It is embedded, it has a smiling face, but it's a big machine behind it. Which kind of brings us to your century, the 21st century, where two things change. Events accelerate, the speed of events is almost unimaginable in the 20th and 19th century, and transparency rules. So what do leaders look like in this 21st century? Are they Bismarckian? Of course not. Are they like Roosevelt? No. I would say leaders in the 21st century are very different. They're more diverse. They may or may not be political leaders. Who are some of these people? Bill Gates, you know, Microsoft, Oprah, everybody knows. Jack Ma, leading Chinese businessman. Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany. Narandi Modi, the leader of the largest democracy in the world. 800 million people voted in the last Indian election. Who's that top center? Come on, folks, Gaga. Poker face, bad romance, get with the program. She's got 42 million followers on Twitter. Is she a leader in the arts? Yeah. Leadership changes in this 21st century. So let's unpack that and look at some of the tools of leadership in this very different 21st century. And I'm gonna start with the number one thing you can do to be a good leader in the 21st century. You can listen better, listen better. This, by the way, is not Photoshop. This is a Belgian air defense officer in the 1930s. He is listening for incoming aircraft. This is quite innovative for the time. I put it here as metaphor to make the point that we need to listen not only to our boss, but to our subordinates, to our peers, and in the most difficult sense, to listen to our opponents. Listening. What else can we do? What you're doing right here, education. This is the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, where I spent five years as dean after I finished as Supreme Allied Commander in NATO. Education matters deeply. But it is not the education that you are gifted here at the Naval Academy, in my view. Your education begins on the day you leave this campus. That is the day that you own your education. That is the day when what you read begins to become the sum of the intellectual capital that you bring to the table as a leader. And it is not only powerful books of nonfiction like this, reading balanced, sensible weekly magazines like Economist that are not part of this breathless 24-7 news cycle. It's not only this kind of nonfiction, your education, is composed of the novels you read, of the fiction you read, because only fiction can place you like a time machine in a different place. You wanna understand the orphan master's son, North Korea, a dystopian universe, won the National Book Award. Wanna understand the mind of Vladimir Putin, throw away that CIA report, read the novel, Palace of Treason want to understand what it's like to live in an authoritarian society, check out Margaret Atwood's just published The Testaments, the sequel to The Handmaid's Tale. Nonfiction, fiction, reading, education, listening, those are fundamental 
to any leader. What else? Leaders are also innovators. And innovation can be as tiny as a post-it. It can be as huge and galactic as a moonshot. It can be as crazy as the idea of putting airplanes on a ship. Innovation is fundamental to leaders. And here's what you think of, right? When you think of innovation in our world, in the military, unmanned vehicles, drones, artificial intelligence, certainly that's part of innovation. But innovation can also be this. When I was commander of US Southern Command in Miami, my problem was many of the militaries in that world to the south, in Latin America and the Caribbean, are deeply suspicious of the US military because of our repeated military engagements in this region over the last century. My team came up with this idea, sports. Find the best baseball players in the military, put them in uniforms, take them and conduct clinics in Latin America and the Caribbean. Do the same thing for women track stars. We built a completely different way of thinking about how to engage in this world to the south. That's innovation that has nothing to do with all these marvelous technologies. That must be part of leadership innovation. And I'll give you another one. This is Afghanistan. And when I was the NATO commander in Afghanistan, I had a problem. My problem was most of the Afghan security forces could not read. And so you couldn't train them because they couldn't read a map. They couldn't follow simple directions. The Taliban had withheld education. So over time, the innovation was literacy training. We taught them to read. We have trained 800,000 young Afghans to read and write. This may be the most lasting thing we do in Afghanistan. Let me tell you something about Afghanistan. Look at my hands. If you can read in Afghanistan, you take a pen and you put it in your pocket like this so others can see it and know that you are a literate person. At the end of a six-month literacy course, which occurs while we are teaching them to fight. At the graduation ceremony, we give them a pen. You should see the look on a young Afghan's face when they put that pen in their pocket and join the society of those who can read. Innovation takes many forms. It's hits and misses. You're going to miss more than you hit. You have to find ways to put the roots of innovation down deep in an organization, whether it is as small as the division you lead when you walk out of Annapolis and you're in charge of eight people on a submarine or 20 people on a surface ship. Put those roots of innovation deep and reward the innovators. It can be as simple as a crumpled post it on a computer screen. It can be as big as a command advancement in a division. Reward the innovators. Innovation matters deeply for leaders. And I'll close on innovation by saying, tell the stories. Tell the stories of innovators. And I'll give you a practical example. When I was Commander Southern Command, we captured this thing built in the jungle of Colombia. When we caught it, it had three tons of cocaine in it. And I said to my team, hey, great job. We caught one of those drug-running submersibles. And I said, bring it to Miami, and we'll put it right in front of the headquarters. And my team said, great idea, Admiral. It'll be like a trophy of war. No. It'll be an example to everybody who pulls into U.S. Southern Command of how smart our opponents are. They are innovators. Who thinks that up? Building a submarine in the jungle to move dope through the Caribbean? That's innovation. 
We need those kind of stories to make sure we are innovators as well. How about communication? Are good leaders communicators? You bet they are. And good leaders know communication is not a megaphone, it's a bridge. There are two sides to communication, and I'll illustrate it with the jellyfish. The jellyfish has more neural sensors than anything else in the animal kingdom on a body weight mass basis. It is one big sensor. And good leaders know before you pick up the pen to write the message, you have to sense the sea in which you are swimming. You have to find out how to align that message before you pick up the pen. You have to figure what are the techniques of communications. Check out the presentation secrets of Stephen Jobs before you pick up the pen. Only after you do all those things are you ready to truly communicate. Good leaders are good communicators. And you got to make it happen as a communicator in this world. And you're looking at this and you're thinking, OK, Admiral Stavridis, these are sea lanes of communication. No. Are these airline routes? No. Fiber optic cables under the ocean? No. Too many. Only 300 cables carry the internet. What is this? This is Facebook. The brighter the white, the higher the concentration of Facebook use. The tell, if you're a poker player, is that China is dark because they have built firewalls. We got to move our messages as leaders in this world. And it matters if we move them at scale or if we move them retail, one on one. This is me as Supreme Allied Commander in NATO a few years ago with the Supreme Commander of the Russian Armed Forces, General Nikolai Makarov. I always liked General Makarov. As you can see, he's a man of normal height. <laughs> we need to move our messages clearly and cleanly, both at the personal level and at scale. Communication. So we've talked about listening, education, innovation, communication. Let me close with this, with collaboration, teamwork. You know, in the cliche image of teamwork are a bunch of folks rowing together, and that is certainly teamwork. I like this, a peloton. These ladies are kind of competing, they're kind of drafting, people fall down. Collaboration is messy. Sometimes it's very formal, like a NATO alliance. More often, it's a coalition. This is the coalition against the Islamic State. Sometimes you have to reach for non-traditional partners as you collaborate. An example, in my view, would be India. This is the golden temple of Amritsar, sacred to the Sikh faith. India is a non-traditional but potentially vital partner for the United States. This is a leadership challenge to find those innovative leadership solutions in collaboration. All of this is based on values. And our values come to us from the ancient Greeks, from the East, through the Enlightenment, that's the young Voltaire, through our founding fathers to principled leaders like Angela Merkel. Values. Look at this. This looks like a wonderful photograph of a US Navy destroyer. The photograph was taken in 1949. Look closely at this photo. All of you have stood in formations. What's wrong with this photo? First rank, officers. Second rank, chief petty officers. Crew behind them. Look at that second rank of chief petty officers. 
gap. Three chief petty officers missing on the left. I looked at this photograph. It was given to me as a gift. And I looked very closely to find what happened. How do you stage a military photograph with three missing chief petty officers? I found the three missing chief petty officers. They're all the way in the back of the formation. There are three African Americans. Photograph taken in 1949. I don't know what happened when this photo was taken. I'll give you a highly educated guess. My guess is the XO, second in command, staged the photo. Three chiefs, right where they belonged. Down came the captain, and he said, you three, go stand in the back with your division. Our Navy, 1949. I show you this photo as leaders to tell you two things. Number one, Look closely at things, something that can look gorgeous. When you look closely, you find the flaws. Secondly, as a leader, ask yourself every day, what am I doing now that in 70 years is going to look oh so wrong? Values. Let me close, and then we'll open it up for a couple of questions. Sometimes people say to me, well, you know, how fast should leaders go? Really fast. You got to move fast. Here's a cheetah. This is the fastest thing on Earth. It can go from zero to 60 miles an hour in about three seconds. And look at it. It's optimized for speed, right? It's got a really narrow head, kind of shaped like an ax that cuts through the air. It's got strong legs. It's got big lungs to process oxygen. It's got powerful back legs. Whoops. Look at the tail on the cheetah. If you are creating the fastest thing on earth by evolution or creation, take your pick, why would you give it a big, huge tail? Why doesn't it have like no tail or like a little bunny tail? Yeah, the engineers in the crowd will know it needs that big tail for balance. Because if it turns suddenly, if it didn't have that tail, almost the size of its back legs, it would just go tumbling into the undergrowth. So as leaders, we have to go fast, but we have to stay in balance. And leadership is hard. I'm Greek-American. I'm required to have a Greek myth in every talk. Here it is, Sisyphus. Listen to me. The boulder of leadership will roll back down on you. Whatever level you occupy, whether you are the superintendent of the Naval Academy or the chief of naval operations or the supreme allied commander, or you are the electrical division officer on a submarine, or the fire control officer on a DDG, or you're just joining a squadron, and you're the junior maintenance officer, the boulder of leadership will roll back down. The tools of leadership we've talked about will help you push that boulder back up. But what will matter the most is your character what is in your heart. Last image. This photograph was taken five years ago. It's on a beach in Somalia. These are migrants, refugees. And they're holding up flip phones, trying to get a better signal. Newsflash, that does not work. Prosaically, they are trying to find a better phone signal. Metaphorically, what is happening in this picture? This is a picture of hope. They are hoping to connect. They are hoping to get to the next stage of their journey. They are holding those phones up against the light that shines in front of them, hoping. So here's what I want you to remember from this 
Forrestall lecture. If you remember nothing else about our evening together, remember this quote. And as you launch on the gorgeous trajectory of your lives into this Navy and Marine Corps, remember this. It's a quote from Napoleon. I like quoting Napoleon because short people have to stick together at all times. Here's the quote. Remember this. A leader is a dealer in hope. A leader is a dealer in hope. All of these tools we've talked about, all of these challenges, the greatest gift a leader provides is hope. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you.